Okay, so they tell me I'm on. It's good to see you. Good to be with you uh, tonight. You know, the, the usual thing that uh, speakers do and TV shows and books do is they leave you with a cliffhanger every week, you know, to, to try to get you to come back. Well, Howard and I have reversed it. And the cliffhanger is, who's going to get up here and be here on Wednesday night? So now you know, hopefully you'll stay and not run away. Uh, but it is good to be back with you, and I appreciate Howard stepping in like that. The great lessons. Uh, we, we watched up in Gainesville uh, online, and so appreciate that. We are in Acts, the fifth chapter, if you'll be turning over there. In fact, if you'll go ahead and go there, I'm going to start by by reading the first six verses. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Okay, chapter 5 is kind of a long chapter, covers several events, some of them which we look at more often than not. This is probably the thing we, this and maybe one verse towards the end, are usually about all we remember from chapter 5. And as we've been doing, uh, going through the book of Acts, we've been asking ourselves the question, why, did, why is this story here? Of all the things that Luke had to choose from, and we know that he had a lot more stuff to pick from uh, than he had room to put in the book, why did he pick this one? And why is this story here? What do you think? Yes? I think it's a good lesson. In do we have somebody that, a roving mic, having watched on Wednesday night online, waiting for the mic to get there is, is, is a big help. I think it's a, a good lesson on the importance of honesty. Okay, important of to honesty. To me, it's one of the best lessons, you know. Um, I was telling an example a while back, um, I, maybe it wasn't in here, but it was one of the classes about my brother worked for Sears, and it, for Sear, when he worked at Sears, they would give discounts to family members. So when I found out about that, I was like, oh, I need a washer. But um, he said, well, he said, actually, Gina, it's for the immediate family. And my brother was always very good about, and he would not go over that line, where a lot of people would probably, you know, say, you, right. know, you can get a washer, and I'll tell him it's for immediate family. But um, so I've, it's just the importance of being honest. And, okay. and also something that was supposed to go to the Lord's work, you know, okay. and then not being honest about it. It really drives home when, when we tell those little lies and try to convince okay. ourselves that, well, it's not that bad, you okay. know. Okay. Well, I said, I guess two weeks ago when I said we were going to study this, this, to me, this is maybe the scariest chapter. It is. Maybe in the entire New Testament, but certainly in the book of Acts. Because they probably gave yeah. a lot of money. They okay. didn't give it all, and they lied about all right. it. All right. Other thoughts about why this story is in there? Mike? Okay. Now I thought so. You know, it makes me think today, think of, as we see um, probably any organizations, but churches particularly, when they start growing fast, there's a lot of people, a lot of things going on, and if they, and you see it time and time again, they kind of explode and then crash and burn because probably smaller things early on, they didn't handle as well, and this is one of those cases, I think. If they were to let that slide... Okay. You know, it, it would have just gotten worse and set the tone that, you know, eh. Okay. Lack, lack of honesty and greed. 
Yeah. A, lot, a lot of times what brings organizations down in flames. Renee? I think, too, there's a lesson here that God intends for us to be sacrificial with his body. And he blesses us, and we need to bless God's body and the programs of the church and not, you know, as soon as we have one little financial hiccup, we, you know, don't do what we pledge to do and keep God, what we okay. give back to God as a priority in our lives. Okay. All right. And we're not really told why they held it back, you know, whether, you know, it, and it apparently wasn't some crisis that just popped up. It was, they got to looking at what they got, and, you know, I... Maybe we'll just keep some of that, you know, just in case, okay? Um, all right, Jimmy? <laughs> I think it's along with what everything that's been said, it just shows how important it is to God to keep his body, to keep the body pure. And um, when they lied, they, he didn't, um, uh, Peter didn't say you lied to us. He said you lied to the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay. And then, so. All right, you, you guys have hit on all the things that, I, that I, I hope to weave together here in the next few minutes. And let's start with sort of springing off what Mike said. Over the next couple of chapters, and we kind of ended it at the, end of last, at the end of the last chapter when, we talk, when it talks about Barnabas selling property and laying it at the apostles' feet, and the, and the whole paragraph is about how they were a community and they were taking care of each other, and... That begins a section that goes for a couple of chapters just about things that the young church was going through. It's kind of building up to chapter 7 and, and the um, uh, stoning of Stephen and the persecution getting so bad everybody gets scattered. But in between Peter and John getting arrested... Uh, and persecution and stuff that's happening, we have just some snippets of stuff um, about what was going on. You know, how did this young church uh, who just came in to be, what sort of problems did they face? What sort of, you know, what sort of good things happened? But what were some of the things that happened that, oh yeah, they had to deal with that stuff? And I think that's important because sometimes... I know I'm guilty of sort of having a, and I, I'm not sure what the word is I'm looking for here, sort of a, a, an idealist view of the early Christians. And I don't want to take anything away from what they faced. Them walking away, many of them, from family uh, and generations of what they had been taught to believe in the Messiah. And I don't want to take anything away from the incredible persecution that many of them suffered, lost jobs and family and, and physical, you know, physical harm. But we see all of that and we're so impressed by it that sometimes I think we think that the young Christians, that are the, the early Christians and the church, that they were somehow these super spiritual folks that they could just handle all this stuff because, you know, they were like Abraham. You know, they had the spiritual S, you know, tattooed on their chest and temptations and big decisions and stuff really weren't big decisions for them, but they were. And so these folks faced the kind of decisions about what do I do with my worldly goods? You know, do I really want to share with these folks that are, you know, camped out here that ought to go back home? You know, am I going to be willing to share with them? Um... We're going to read, you know, about the Grecian widows in a couple of chapters who were getting shorted on food, and they got upset about it. Um, an interesting study is for you to go through the epistles and see and start categorizing verses and see how much of the epistles, how much of its doctrine, okay, what we think of as doctrine, and how much of it is exhortation and teaching to the Christians about how to get along with each other. When, when you start actually going through and looking at that, you sort of, you know, your, your eyes will get kind of big because you realize that they don't get along, they didn't get along any better than we do. <laughs> you know, they had differences of opinion, they had, th you know, different strengths and different weaknesses and all the stuff that we have, and I think that's one reason that this story and some other things that we'll read about um, are here. 
is to help us understand that the decisions that they made and what they're going through, they're like us. They're like us. And, we, and the, it's not for us to excuse ourselves in the weak areas, but it's to realize that when they stood up to persecution, when they shared with each other, when they did the right things, that they were making the right decisions just like us and to draw encouragement from that. And so after, after seeing folks come and make these gifts at the apostles' feet, and Barnabas in particular singled out, because he, you know, we're going to read more about Barnabas, but he apparently sells a significant and makes a significant gift. What, what do you suppose happened after Barnabas gave that gift? People see it. I mean, he laid it at the apostles' feet. What do people do when they see somebody do something really sacrificial? I think, well, they all talk about it. Probably give them some glory, and then they want to imitate it. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's really These guys, it doesn't... Sometimes we get hung up on that they didn't give all the money, but the thing is, they lied about what they were giving. So they, all you can interpret is they made a big deal maybe about how much they sold their land for okay. and they're giving it all to the church and they weren't, okay. you know. So, uh, but they probably wanted that attention and that acclamation that, uh, that there, we all like. There, it, those of you that were at the color conference when we did that little thing, we looked at the different personalities. Um, there's an aspect of it that's in all four colors, but there are a couple of the personalities where recognition and perception as being competent are, are significant parts of those personalities. And, and I think it played into the, we're going to go give this gift, people are going to see it, they're going to think good of us, we're going to, I mean, this is going to be a good thing, and... We can give a bunch of this, and it looks like we're giving a lot, and you know we can still have some stuff for ourselves. Okay, so all all of that is 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 factoring into this. As Jimmy correctly pointed out, you know Peter says, you know the problem here is not that you lied to me. The problem is that you lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied you lied to God. And isn't that consistent with what David wrote in the Psalms? When he was repenting of the sin with Bathsheba, where he said, God, against you and you only have I sinned. In one sense, that ain't true. <laughs> you know, he had a guy murdered. He did, you know, he did a bunch of stuff. But the root problem was that he had sinned against God. And that's the root of what's going on here. Let's read a few more verses, and I'll share a few more thoughts about why I think this is here. About three hours later, in verse 7, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. And Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Two other, I think, very, very important reasons why this story is here. One, and maybe three. One is just like the healing of the, the man who was crippled in chapter 3. People knew about it. It happened in front of everybody. This was a story that was known. And Luke telling the story here does a couple of things. Makes it clear that what happened was not because the apostles got mad because they had tried to coerce this money out of the church and they didn't give it. And so, well, I got the power. You're out of here. And we see this throughout the book of Acts that the apostles are placed in their proper role. They're not there because they were great organizers. Or they put together this great multi-level marketing whatever that grew up to become this huge church that took over the world. And it wasn't because um, 
they were good at raising money and making money for themselves. And this story is very clear. Peter says, look, you didn't have to, it, it was yours before you sold it. You didn't have to sell it. And then when you sold it, you didn't have to give it all to us. But you came and you projected the fact that you were giving us everything that you got and you were lying. Okay. So that's one. The second thing is, as a young church, well, let me ask this question first. Are Ananias and Sapphira the last liars who are Christians? Okay, everybody, everybody's kind of going, no, no, okay. So why aren't people dropping dead? Thankfully. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> why are people not dropping dead? Yeah, say, say that oh, say that into the mic. Because it was a New Testament church, and they were performing signs. The okay. apostles were performing signs and wonders, and and it was setting the tone for the way church ought, ought to okay. be. Okay. Okay. My, my two cents. S certainly, things were happening as as the church was getting started through the Spirit to help get the church established, to confirm their worth. You know. Peter couldn't go into the temple and say, okay, turn over here to the Gospel of Luke. You know, I want to read from you to Luke. So the, the Spirit was confirming those things. We'll read more about that in just a few verses. Um, but I think the Spirit is helping to establish that the, kind of, the church is going to be about honesty. Okay? It's going to be about folks' hearts being right with God, not the show of piousness that they were familiar with between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those guys, that at this particular time, it is crucial that the church stay on the right path with regard to this kind of issue. And so the Spirit says, we're not going to argue about it. We're going to take them out. Okay? We can't let this pollute uh, the church don't even want a hint of it. It's not that different to me, it seems, than Achan when they went into the promised land, okay, who went and hid, disobeyed and hid some stuff. And God said, we're not going to have that. That's not what we're about. And he took out that whole family. And the fact that the, the Spirit is serious about how we project ourselves and what we say to each other, what we do with our resources and what we, you know, what we project about that. It's making the point that it is important and that we're, you know, we're not going to have, we're not going to have it another way. Gina and then Jim. Uh, I just, I love all those examples in the early church, just, you know, that we, I feel like we really should focus on. Um, you know, I'm just thinking too about, um, when they talk about praying, when you pray, don't do it in front of everyone. You know, go into your quiet room, and and uh, and also when you have people coming into the church, you know, it's like don't put the all the fancy people up okay. front and the poor people in the back. And okay. the examples on giving, the widow, okay. you know, with her, you know, the other people gave out of their abundance about giving from your heart. Just all those examples are so okay. excellent. Okay. Which they were tempted, you know. Why, why would James spend a couple of chapters talking about that in his letter if they weren't struggling with that? Okay. Jimmy. I think along with your point, Dave, is that it shows that uh, it, it was important because it shows we have on our own personal relationship to God. Okay. And that is uh, Ananias lied, but they didn't say because Sapphira was his wife that they were going to put her to death as well. They asked her, okay. gave her an opportunity okay. to, uh, to tell the truth, be truthful. Okay. And then she did, and okay. as a result, she the, suffered the same consequences. I guess the last point that I wanted to make about this, and this, this may be stretching it a little bit, but I'm, I, I, I don't think so. And that is, when, when you think about, in, in our culture and in our times, and the way people think about church, Church is kind of a dirty word, okay? Um, it's, oh, churches, you know, they're full of hypocrites. They're full of, you know, all they want is your money. All they want to, and folks will say lots of bad things about the church. 
And, and even amongst our fellowship, it's easy to grumble a little bit. Well, why are the elders doing this? You know, why, you know, why do we have to go back to two services? Why, do we, why does that song leader lead those songs? And, and in a way, we're sort of putting down the church. And we forget the fact that the church is not something that we came up with. We didn't come up with it. The apostles didn't come up with it. It's something God came up with. And as serious as the Spirit was about lying in that context and, and doing things for show, I think that same principle, we ought to, you know, we ought to sit back a little bit and, and think twice before we grumble about the church it's God's body God's family we get to be a part of it and I, I, I think we lose that sometimes and, and this, this story helps us see how serious the spirit is about protecting and keeping the church the way that it's supposed to go Mike you know I just want to say I think we like to get indignant and offended when we say, oh, the culture today is, is the church is a bad word or they make fun of us or whatever, but they do that because we gave them reason to do it. Okay. I mean, we love to be indignant about this or that. We, okay. it's, we've become quite the culture of, of being offended, yeah. you know, and, and everybody's against us or whatever, but how and many, how many, we want to put laws in to legislate morality, but how many of us go next, right. next door and talk to our neighbor yeah. about Jesus? You know, yeah. it's and, and certainly there is, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that, Mike, because certainly there's a difference between the things that folks at church or in the name of church have done that aren't right and not what the Spirit would defend and not what God would be pleased with and equating that with what God wants. Okay, and, and what we should be striving for. There's, there's a big difference there. You can't, you can't lump either in with the other. you got to discern between the two and uh, cherish the one and disdain the other, frankly. Okay, great point. Um, and actually, what, what we're talking about, it, it sort of pops up in these next few verses. Let's read a few more verses. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. This is a strange... We, we don't usually look at the... This is one of those paragraphs that when we're reading through Acts, we kind of skip over and don't spend any time with. And there's some really interesting things in here. First off, just... It's almost a throwaway sentence. The apostles perform many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. We've talked about that. We've talked about confirming the word. We've talked about um, establishing the authority that the apostles had. What does that sentence not say? There's something significant that it doesn't say. Jimmy, Jimmy wants to guess. Jimmy wants to guess where my crazy mind is going. <laughs> you know, it talks about the miraculous signs and wonders. You know, when Jesus, okay. when any anytime he heals someone, he would also leave some impart spiritual wisdom by okay. sharing the word. Okay. The word of God. How were the apostles performing these signs and wonders? 
to give him the gift, okay, by the power of the, Holy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we read back in chapter 2, 38, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But we get to chapter 4 or 5 and it says that it, it does not say and all the believers perform signs and wonders that, okay, it does not say that. And I think that's significant because we're, go we're going to see as we go on through the book of Acts that the, the miraculous things that were done through the Holy Spirit were either done directly by the apostles or they can be traced to someone that the apostles laid their hands on. That the, that the thrust and the purpose of the Holy Spirit that's talked about in Acts chapter 2 wasn't get baptized and look at, the, look at the magic tricks that you'll be able to do. It's about, no, you'll, you'll have a spirit for right living. That's the thrust of the spirit. And we get that confused. We want to be. A, we want the signs. We want stuff that will prove to me. Well, yeah, I really got the Holy Spirit, as opposed to having faith that God did what He said He was going to do when we got baptized, and we have strength for the life that He's called us to live. Gina's about to go yeah. crazy. <laughs> on, I'm no spring chicken here, but um, I was going to say, um, you know, when you hear the word fear. You know, you think, well, great fear seized everybody. You'd think no one would come, but it's not the kind of fear that we think of fear like we're all afraid of. It was kind of godly fear that brought people okay. together. I just wanted to make that point because it says great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And the next thing you know, everyone's showing up and, and just wanting to get in his shadow and be, be healed and wanting to bring the sick and the ones tormented. So it was not the kind of fear. When I hear fear, you know, you think, well, if I'm afraid of something, I'm not going to go near it. It's not that kind of fear. It was a godly fear. Okay. I just wanted to make that point. Well, it, it's good because it's where I want to go next. Okay. Be because the next, the next sentence that I want to look at is verse 13. Okay. So they're all meeting in Solomon's colonnade. And by this time, there's several thousand of them, right? Okay. So th this is not your Zoom small group setting up over in the corner of Solomon's Colonnade and nobody knows you're there. I mean, you're, you're, you're I won't say large and in charge, but you're, you know, they're there in a significant presence. And, but verse 13 says, no one else dared join them even though they were hardly regarded by the people. Why? Why does nobody want to join them? Well, first of all, they probably knew about what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Could be. Okay. They were just a little bit timid joining up with this group. Okay. Because if you, you know, go certain places, they may be have their feet waiting at the door to carry you out. Okay. I think, I think that could very well be part of it. Why, why else might they, folks not want to dare join them? Speaking for myself, when I come across people that I am awed by, I'm also intimidated by it, and I'm, okay. you know, and I'm more comfortable not getting close to them. Okay. You know, I, that doesn't yeah. mean I think any less of them. It just means that I probably, you know, I'm just intimidated by them. This is something really different, and there's something going on here. And man, there's stuff I see that, that I'm, I'm really drawn to, but I'm kind of intimidated by it as well. Okay, good thought. Jimmy? And I think well, they were still, you know, these, the Christians were still being persecuted. And even though they saw, you know, even though they saw these miraculous signs and miracles being performed, there still was that fear of what man might do to them. If We're only two him. chapters away from Peter and John being drugged before the Sanhedrin and told them you can't talk about this stuff and don't and, and threatened. 
Okay, that wasn't, that wasn't done in secret either. Folks knew about that as well. So I, I think all of those things played together where folks were just kind of, man, there, there, there's, there's something going on here. I don't want to, you know, I like my job. I don't know how, want, how close I want to get to this. But it says that nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord were added to their number. Okay, in, in spite of that. Good, good thoughts. I thought I saw another hand or something there. All right. And so they're doing signs and what? They're doing stuff. Okay. Um, and so much so that folks, you know, I don't know how close I want to get to these guys, but man, my, you know, my mom is really sick and you know, maybe Peter walked past, maybe, you know, remember that woman that touched Jesus' coat? You know, maybe we can maybe we can get some of these here. Back, back to your earlier point, Dave, about that. Everybody didn't receive that the power, you know, like the, okay. the apostles did. So these okay. people were still. They you see this stuff ha taking place, but still there's some doubt in their mind okay. because we didn't get this this power that we see Peter and the other apostles using. We don't have that power. Okay. So we still have to be a little cautious about. Okay. Okay. How we respond. Look at the flow that we've seen. So, uh, go ahead, Mike, and then, then I'll, I'll make I was going to say, I think it ties to the fear. You know, today we're so comfortable. We think, ah, when I die and get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus this. And I'm going to you know, hear people say these, you know, I'm going to ask Jesus what sports team. Does he like the Gators or not or something? You know, we, we say these kind of things. But, you know, yeah. when you think about it, if I, if, if I saw someone heal something, someone, I'd be scared. I yeah, would be scared, not just yeah, fear. I'd be yeah. scared. I mean, yeah. I think there's a lot we we think because we're so removed. To, but if you saw some of this stuff. Okay. Well, and tying it, it in with what Renee said, yeah. I've seen them heal folks, and I've seen folks drop dead. As, as like, Along with, we get later, just okay. in the next chapter, okay. the whole, they're meeting in Solomon's Colonnade. Okay. Well, that's, there's a lot of okay. people who don't like them there, and they don't like the dirty, the ugly, messy people. Any, anybody in. here have any kind of thought before you drove to the building tonight that, you know, if I go over there tonight, I might lose my job? Nope. No. 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 We didn't think that. Nobody even thought about that. More, and the flow that we're seeing in Acts is we have the Holy Spirit coming on the apostles, them getting up and preaching, a bunch of folks responding to that, them beginning to grow as a group, and the leaders getting jealous even though there's this fantastic miracle that's performed, they drag Peter and John in for the Sanhedrin, threaten to beat them and to do all kinds of stuff to them. They go away, and in chapters 4 and 5, we see them grow anyway. We see more signs. and I mean, this, this is... And the church is, is... Maybe embryonic is not the right word, but it's, it's, it's beginning to grow and establish itself... And Luke shares with us some of the things that are happening. And then in verse 17, persecution raises its head again. And we, we will see this sort of flow throughout uh, much of the book. Read, in, in verse 17, read with me. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they'd been told, began to teach the people. Okay, the high priest and the Sadducees were really more politically in charge than the Pharisees were. And if you remember, the Pharisees not, not only being established and being in bed with the Romans because their financial security um, sort of dictated that they, you know, say one thing about God and the law and on the other side, you know, make sure they didn't upset the Romans, okay, and who didn't believe in the resurrection, so this whole story of preaching around the resurrection just galled them. 
and everybody's going over there. You know, we've done all these things to make it not cool for people to hang out with Christians, and they're going anyway. We got to do something about this. And so they grab, they grab the apostles and throw them in jail. Angel gets them out. What would you do? What would you want to do if you got arrested and thrown in jail and an angel came and got you out? What would you want to do next? All right. Okay. Yeah. Let's go home. Let's, let's, maybe we can go preach, you know, maybe we can go out here to, you know, Bethlehem or Bethany or one of those places and, you know, maybe, maybe we can do some of that there. But the Spirit says no. Go and tell, and interesting the way it says it, tell the full message of this new life. Okay? Tell the whole story. Don't, you know, don't sugarcoat it, but tell them the full message of this new life. Gina? Maybe, you know, we wouldn't do that one. Maybe we wouldn't. We want to share the gospel more. Okay. I'd like to give us a little bit more credit. I think if the angel came and saved me, I might say, hmm, I'm going to go tell this. I, I, I've known people that would, that would want to do that. Nat, I say naturally. I'm not naturally that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. You've, you've seen the resurrected Lord. That, that obviously makes a difference. Okay, all right. The next few verses, I think, are some of the most humorous verses in the entire book. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jails, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They didn't use force because they feared that the people would stone them. I hope you see a little bit of of the humor in this. Just try to imagine... You're involved in keeping the jail. And these are not Romans, okay? If, these were, if they were in a Roman jail, they'd be killed for going to the jail and not finding them there. These, these are, this is the Jewish temple guard, okay? But they're still, you know, I don't know what, there's nobody here, and somebody comes running, and, oh, they're, they're over here, don't you see you guys are over here? This would have been fun to see some of the expressions and, you know, sort of things that they said to them. But they're not messing around. They they go and take them. But it says they don't use force because they're afraid of the people. And it goes back to what we were talking about, that people highly, they might not want to go sit with them. They might want to stand off, you know, just within earshot so they could hear what was being said. Uh, but they, they respected him, okay? They, they were really taking positive note of what these folks were doing. And so they pulled them in. Verse 27. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. Now again, this is the same high priest uh, and or his son who back in Luke said it's better for one man to die than for the people to perish. This is, this is not a nice guy. Okay? This, is, this is a fairly ruthless individual. We gave you strict orders, verse 28, not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. They understood what was being taught. It wasn't a question of they couldn't grasp it. It's like, you're trying to make us guilty for doing this. We, we turned him over to the Romans. They crucified him. 
but in fact they had blood on their hands. Peter and the other apostles replied, and this is the other verse in chapter 5 that we know, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Not the same Peter cursing in front of the servant girl. Oh, you're from Galilee. You're with him, aren't you? No, I don't know him. I'm not with him. Same guy. Same guy. Now a witness of the resurrection. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Let's talk about Gamaliel for just a minute. We've got a couple minutes left here. Who studied under Gamaliel, at the feet of Gamaliel? Paul. Paul. Okay. All right. He, Saul. Okay. All right. All right. Gamaliel, but Gamaliel is a Pharisee. Okay. He believes in the resurrection or in a resurrection. Okay. And in, in reading about him, he was one of the most respected rabbis uh, of that time, and, and really in, maybe in Jewish history. Okay. And it, it's kind of like, you know, I'm trying to think of an example. You ever been in the presence of someone that just you know, has that gravitas when, when they speak, people pay attention, okay? And usually it's because of, you know, who they are and what they've done and what they've accomplished. And in this case, you know, his, his teaching. But he's, a, he's able to command the attention of the high priest and the Sanhedrin who are made up of folks who do not believe what he believes. But he's able to command their attention and he says, look, slow down a minute, second. Men of Israel, consider carefully, verse 35, what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutius appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers dis were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. Pretty smart guy. Yes. Okay. And, and this, um, this sort of perspective on life and God being in control is pretty consistent with Pharisee, Pharisaical thought you know, for all their legalism. They did believe that God was in control and that, um, you know, things were going to, you know, you, you might try to do some things, but if, if God wanted it to happen, it was going to happen. And man, it just points this out. You know, look at all this happening. You can't deny the, the signs and the wonders that these folks are doing. We've already read in chapter 3 about how they couldn't deny it because there was the guy walking around. And Gamaliel says, look, don't, you know, this is, if this is of God, you ain't going to be able to stop it. Gina. You know what kills me, though? Instead of listening, you know, and letting them go, they ended up flogging them anyway. It's like we're going we're gonna to get, a, you know, we're okay. gonna get something out of this. It just, set, it just shows the, e the e to me the evil. Like, okay. okay, we'll let them go, but we're going to flog them. Okay. I don't know what that entailed, but it doesn't sound like a good thing. No. No, they, they, they didn't get 10 lakhs, licks from the principal, you know, and, and sent home. It says, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Okay. Uh, if it's the same as with Jesus, it, you know, it was skin removing. It was a beating hard enough to remove skin. Okay. They, and then they ordered them again, don't speak in the name of Jesus. Okay, so now it's not... 
we went to jail and an angel let us out. What are we going to do? It's now we've been brought before the highest Jewish court in the land and we've been beaten on top of it. What are we going to do? And we read what they did. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. We're going to stop, we're going to stop here. But that's, that's a verse we ought to read when things are tough. You know, and how, how do we react to tough times? How do we react to opposition? How do we react to family members who, you know, really slight us? You know, or co-workers who do stuff to us that just, you know, are, are not right. Our human thought is, you just wait. I'm going to get them back. You know, boy, I wish I'd said, I wish I'd said that when they said that. You know, that would have put them in their place. No. Rejoice that we're worthy to suffer for the name. Ain't easy, but it, it's also, it's a tremendous encouragement uh, from these guys. All right, uh, we'll let you figure out who's going to be up here next week. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to tell Howard in just a minute so that he knows. Because the last thing we want is to walk in the building. <laughs> it's like, well, you're the guy that's going to speak. Let's, let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and for being able to read about the, the beginnings of the church, to, to recognize that it was made up of folks uh, who had been redeemed just like we've been redeemed. Not that because they were so good they got picked to be first, but that your message has always been about redeeming a lost humanity. Thank you that we're a part of it. Help us to rejoice in that. Help us to rejoice in that when things are not easy. Um, when, when we get in situations where maybe we get slighted or folks do things that they should not do, help us Help our first thought to be to rejoice that we're part of your family. Help us to have the right perspective of your church, that it's your church, that you've intended us not to go off and do things on our own, but to be together, to have relationships with each other, and to encourage and enjoy the life that you've brought us into together. Thank you for being able to be together tonight. Pray you'll take us home safely now, that you'll give us good rest. You'll be with those of us who are, are dealing with various uh, physical things. We think about Bert and Kazma and Gary and, and, and others, uh, Mike, uh, that just are dealing with serious uh, health issues, that you'll continue to help them get the treatment they need, that you'll heal them, and, and they'll be able to be back with us uh, soon. Um, we pray all this in the name of your son, who was willing to die for us, and we're forever grateful. Amen.